Um, welcome back to our plenary and last session for today before we wrap everything up. And uh, it's my absolute pleasure and my honor to introduce our final keynote speaker. Vandana Shiva is, is with us. Vandana, uh, we are so happy uh, that you're with us. Thanks for joining. She's an not only Indian scholar, uh, I have the honor to introduce you now, environmental activist, food sovereignty advocate and author. Uh, by profession, she, she is a physicist based in Delhi, India. Uh, she wrote more than 20 books uh, on topics like ecology, feminism, agriculture, biodiversity. She's one of the top leaders of the International Forum on Globalization. She is a member of so many associations and initiatives. One is the International Organization um, for a Participatory Society. Uh, she uh, served as advisor to the Indian government and of course, not last, not last but least, uh, she was awarded with uh, the Right Livelihood um, Award for everything she has done and still is doing. Vandana, uh, thank you very much for joining us. And we are very much looking forward um, to your uh, keynote. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be able to join from far away digitally uh, your conference on, um, on deep, deep renewability, deep regeneration. Because to me, that's what cradle to cradle means, that things regenerate, things recycle, things arise uh, constantly in, uh, in renewability, multiplicity. I'm very happy also that I can join you from India, which was the land of textiles. Uh, you know, it was the factory of the world, which is why the East India Company wanted to come here. And um, and then the British, as a result of their colonization, created an empire of cotton. They destroyed India's textiles, colonized the land of the indigenous people, not just in India, but of the Americas. And then they captured Africans as slaves. The issue of Black Lives Matter is all connected to the empire of cotton. Because so much lab was grabbed that you then had to grab slaves to be able to pick the cotton and then take it to the mills of Lancashire and Manchester and use the internal combustion engine that should never actually have been created uh, to then dump on the very countries which they had colonized industrial clothing. And our freedom was led by Gandhi with his amazing imagination of nonviolence where he said, I'm going to get freedom through the spinning wheel. Of course, no one was spinning by the time he returned from South Africa and he found an old woman who would teach him how to spin. And he got the whole country to spin. And he said, as long as we can make our own clothing, we will be free. As long as we grow indigo and cotton under slavery and wear clothing of slavery, we will be enslaved. And we got our freedom through spinning our own cloth. It was called khadi, which is hand spun and hand woven clothing. It was to deal with the empire of cotton, of the empire of the mills, the satanic mills they used to be called because they also exploited the workers in England. And I have had inspiration from the spinning wheel from the time I've been a child, but even more in my more recent years, dealing with the GMO question, the patenting of seed. And when in 87, I heard the companies talk about owning seed and genetically engineering seed and having an international treaty, the GATT, the trade related intellectual property rights to force this on all our countries my mind went back to the spinning wheel. And I said, in my life now, the seed will be the spinning wheel. And that's what I've done. And that's why I created Navdanya um, and have been saving seeds. But I grew up in a family where my you know, parents, my mother was a freedom fighter. 
and we used to spin in the morning. And we used to dress in khadi, the hand spun, hand woven cloth. And around the time I must have been six, seven years old, this fossil fuel fiber, the nylon was starting to emerge. And everyone was wearing it because it was fashionable. And uh, we wanted to copy, you know, young kids want to copy their peers. And uh, we asked our mother, could we have a nylon frock instead of the khadi that we were wearing? And she said, I'll never stop you. You really want nylon? I'll get you a nylon frock. But just remember, when you wear nylon, you help the millionaire become a little richer and get his next Mercedes car. She did use the word Mercedes <laughs> in India. And, um, and she said, if you wear hand spun, hand woven cloth, a poor woman was able to get their food, food for her children that night. And to me, this is early lessons of the circular economy, injustice in ec economic terms that returns go back to the people who are really creating our fabrics, our clothing with their work, with their love. And since that time, I've only worn handmade clothing and, uh, and I'm every minute conscious of the full journey of what one wears. After all, clothes are our second skin. So much money spent on skincare products. A little consciousness on our second skin would help the world a lot. And I'm so glad you are discussing these issues. I thought of the seed as a spinning wheel. I hadn't not realized that a decade later, Monsanto would in bring illegally the GMO BT cotton seeds to India. And then very rapidly, they started to corrupt our regulatory systems and, um, and started to collect royalties, even though we did not allow patents on seed. In fact, we have a patent law that says plants, animals, and seeds are not human inventions. And I did a lot of work with our parliament to ensure this law would be passed. But Monsanto was collecting illegal royalties. So what's the circular economy of the seed? The circular economy of the seed is that the seed must become seed. It must go cradle to cradle. Circular economy of the seed is it must renew. It must be renewable seed. And all renewable seed multiplies. But even more importantly, living seed that goes cradle to cradle supports life. It doesn't just give rise to the next generation of seed. It supports pollinators and insects. And part of it goes back to the soil as organic matter. And then it supports the tremendous web of life that makes soils fertile. That's what organic farming is. And it's such a beautiful miracle in soil to have millions and billions of organisms that actually have been gifted from the organic matter that the seed gave us. Uh, in one cubic meter of soil, there is, let me just get these figures for you. In one cubic meter, 50,000 earthworms, 50,000 insects and mites, 12 million roundworms, algae, fungi, billions of bacteria. And in 100 grams of soil, 100 grams of soil, you know, we have a whole book with my 36 years of research on, um, on, on basically the economies of regeneration, economies of recycling, and um, in a hundred grams of soil, we have I shouldn't be spending your time looking for the pages and the numbers, but it is an amazing ecosystem, a living ecosystem in the soil. 
Now, when the GMO cotton was introduced illegally, I want to insist it was illegal. I took the case to Supreme Court of India and Monsanto was prevented for four years from selling those seeds. They were spreading them illegally. They're still spreading BT cotton Roundup Ready seeds also illegally. But the first thing that they interrupted was the well-being of the farmer. Because they were collecting royalties, even though they didn't have a patent. Five rupees was the cost of seed before Monsanto came, of cotton seed. And now they were selling it at 4,000 rupees a kilogram. And we never grew cotton in monocultures throughout my life till the late 90s. Cotton would be with millets, would be with the pigeon pea, would be with all the crops a farmer needs. And therefore there was never a distress. And farmer always sold at a good fair price. It was called a cash crop. But Monsanto's BT cotton violated every law of the circular economy. It was a hybrid BT cotton, so the seed did not go to seed. It could not be saved. It did not perform the functions, the ecological functions of living seed. Our studies have shown that there is not a single pollinator on a BT cotton plant, not one. And then on the soil, it's an even more violent assault because what is BT cotton? But for shooting with a gene gun, BT toxins into the plant cells. And now it's expressing at every moment a high dose toxin, 64 times more toxic than the naturally occurring. And it's in the roots, it's in the leaves, it's in the pollen. It's pollen means the bees don't come. Roots and leaves means the soil organisms are dying. And we did a study a few years ago. We did it 10 years after BT cotton. We did an updated study with the top soil ecologist of India. And across five districts of the heart of the BT cotton area, we found average of 50% fungi, which includes the mycorrhizal fungi, have disappeared. And even more shocking, 77% of the soil bacteria have gone. You know, after all, if you have organic matter and you, there's a leaf and there's mulch, that mulch is turned into living soil by bacteria. That's the decomposition circular economy of soil fertility. And the organisms that allow the circular economy of the soil to be created are being killed. And the farmers themselves, because of the very high cost of seed and the fact that it's non-renewable, ended up being in debt and committing suicide. So India has lost since globalization, the middle of the 90s, about 400,000 farmers. And the fact that the Indian farmers are protesting on the streets, and today there's a uh, there's going to be a bit of violence. Police is trying to remove them from the protest. But they're there because of the debt and the suicides and the crisis and the new laws which will make the crisis worse. 400,000 and our studies going home to home and looking at district data shows that where there's BT cotton, there's suicides. Now, 85% of the suicides of India, farmer suicides of India, are related to BT cotton. 85%. So that's not a circular economy. And this is the reason uh, it has become so very important to create a circular economy for clothing and textiles, beginning from the seed to how textiles are made, to the consumer economy, to what fibers do we use, to what dyes do we use. What I have watched happen to junk food is exactly what's happening to junk clothing. More resources are used to produce it, more capital is used to produce it, and miraculously it turns out cheaper. And that's why the issue of true cost is so important. 
I've done a book called The True Cost. And uh, I know there's a film called True Cost linked to the textile industry and all the levels of violence, the workers, the young women who died in the factory in Bangladesh, farmers. But even the ones who wear the clothing, you know, for me, clothing is part of you. It's your expression of who you are. And that's why we've had diversity of clothing around the world. We've now managed to create a monoculture where everyone is in the same t-shirt and the same blue jeans. And just the brand name is different, but the brand name is put after the same clothing is made in the same sold slave factories. Somewhere it goes up to high-end fashion stores and somewhere it goes down to fast fashion stores. But fast fashion and fast clothing for me is wearing clothes that express thoughtlessness an indifference to the ecological cost to the earth and indifference to conditions of those who are working on farms and factories to make our clothes and indifference to our unique identity and conscious choice. Fast fashion makes me a thoughtless clone of millions of others wearing the same throwaway clothing of the same color, irrespective of the culture and climate to which I belong. Fast fashion molds us into identity-less customers and consciousness-less customers. We don't exercise our choice because we are not guided by awareness and consciousness. We, we could become mannequins in the assembly line of throwaway clothing. The assembly line must churn faster and faster to sell more and more and waste more and more clothing instead of cloth being woman in every home Clothes are being stitched at home, clothes being stitched at home or by tailors down the street. Everyone is buying clothing from a handful of chains with exploitation at every level of the supply chain. What's even more disturbing to me is that it's predicted that clothes consumption will rise by 63% while more and more people are without clothes because they're throwaway people. They have no work, they have no livelihoods, they can't buy the clothes. So it's a small group of people and the consumption is increasing 63%. And this means an increase of 62 metric tons to 102 metric tons in 2030 of shirts alone. Fashion goods are purchased even when the old ones are still totally wearable. The quick response model and new supply chain practices of fast fashion even accelerate the speed of it. In recent years, the fashion cycle has steadily decreased to fast fashion retailers selling clothing that is expected to be disposed of after a single wear. We've moved from disposable plastic bags to disposable clothing. This dramatically shortens the consumer's buying cycle Quick changing stocks, low price fashion goods encourage consumers to visit the stores and make purchases more frequently. As a result, excessive stock and untrendy clothes tend up, end up in landfills. They're also contributing, the whole supply chain is contributing to green out gases. And I'm sure in your conference, you discussed of how much is contributed. 85% of the plastic pollution, you know, while um, looking forward to, uh, to meeting with you today, I just went through some of my recent writings and look, look at the titles of news, cyborg babies, scientists find micro particles in a mother's womb for the first time. 85% of the microplastic in life in the ocean comes from clothing. And none of this was thought through. And we are trying desperately to stop it. How do we change? Where do we begin? I think we begin with each of us. I went back to my inspiration in Nam. And we have created seed banks of organic cotton, where the seed can go to seed and there can be a circular economy of seed. But these are community seed banks, so there's a circular circularity of seed exchange. I'm very happy in every village where we work 
farmers have stopped growing GMO cotton. And the GMO cotton is now proven to be a failure to do the one job it was supposed to do, control pests. There are more pests, there are more pesticide use. Three years ago, I had rushed down to Vidharba because 130 farmers had died of pesticide poisoning, spraying on BT cotton crops where you were never supposed to spray pesticide because this was supposed to be an alternative. So we started, of course, to start with the seed. We work with organic cotton because we built Navdanya, the organic movement over these 36 years. I started the organic when the protests in 84 happened um, in Punjab. But then we've joined up with the Gandhi ashrams for hand spinning and hand weaving. And, want, and I call it the fibers of freedom. Call it fibers of freedom because it's freedom of the seed to renew. It's freedom of the spinner and the weaver to have a livelihood and dignity. It's the freedom from toxics because we use only vegetable dyes. It's freedom from being part of supply chains that are causing so much harm to the earth, so much harm to future generations, so much harm to the workers. Uh, it troubles me a lot that in a short 30 years of globalization, we've forgotten that cloth is woven. The word weaver has gone. I mean, as a result of our independence, we brought back our textiles. We made it the center stage to have policy of handmade, handwoven fabrics. The shawl I'm wearing is a tie and dye shawl. And these clothes last, I think this, this shawl must be 50 years old. I'm still wearing my mother's sarees. And they never give, give up. And even if they do, then you can turn it into a spread, you can turn it into a curtain, you can turn it into a quilt. Good clothing never becomes waste. It's always in a circularity of recycling. So last year was 150 years of Gandhi. And I had been called to give the annual lecture, Gandhi lecture. And at the museum and archives, they showed me this very beautiful uh, fabric. Uh, not this one, but in the archives. And this was a sari that Gandhi had woven by hand for his wife, Kasturba. That maroon, we call it Manjistu, it comes from a plant. And he had dyed it himself. And he had stitched the hem himself. And my computer bag is another example of how to have a circular economy. So it's hand woven, hand spun with organic cotton from our farmers, but every leaf is hand printed with vegetable dye. Of course, the background is indigo. And, you know, we had been enslaved for indigo. Before the British colonialism, one bag of indigo used to exchange for a bag of gold. Then they made it slave conditions. So our people were slaves to grow indigo. And then it was really exchanged for blood. We made indigo a color of freedom again. And every leaf has been hand dyed. I think we have to bring love and care back into the economy, whether it is the economy of food or it is the economy of clothing and textiles. The ability of our creativity has been killed. And we will not be able to end exploitation till we bring our heads, our hands, and our hearts back into the economy. I know it's totally doable. We've done it with fibers of freedom and foods of freedom. And our farmers are earning 10 times more by getting rid of the supply chain that's supposed to make them richer. The farmers who were supposed to chase money are in debt. The farmers serving the earth, protecting biodiversity, protecting the bees and the soil organisms actually have higher incomes. And then they're creating a net of other support systems, the dyers, the weavers. Let us reimagine a world that is nonviolent. Let us do it together. I call this project the Fibers of Freedom. I would love to work with you all to see how we, we can make it the new imagination for a post-COVID world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vandana. It is such a pleasure to uh, listen to you and you raised so many 
of those so much important topics we've uh, discussed for uh, this whole day. Um, we, we've discussed a lot about technology, we've discussed about what's possible, what, where we need to um, uh, identify new potentials, business models, service concepts, what's the role of the consumers, what's the role of the producers. Uh, you said disposable uh, plastic bags, uh, that topic became uh, 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 the same thing with disposable clothing. You said um, um, bad, bad quality is when, when, when textiles really become waste. Um, regarding all those um, issues we face, um, and I mean uh, COVID also uh, brings up so many of those issues and points where we see what's what's working within society and what's not what do you what do you think uh, probably putting um, um, priorities what what do you think what should we now change as quick as possible where do you see uh, the strongest the the biggest possible uh, changes to be made that we uh, continue on the path all together uh, for a more sustainable, for a more circular, for more cradle-to-cradle -cradle society? Well, I think a, a very easy place to begin is to basically say no BT cotton. It's failed and I hope the world conscious world should say we're going to use and promote and wear true organic cotton, not better clothing, but true organic cotton that actually works according to the principles of organic. The second thing is we are in a triple emergency. You know, we're in an ecological emergency with both the climate crisis <coughs> as well as the species extinction. And I showed you how just one BT cotton can trigger species extinction. Um, we are in a in an agrarian farmers emergency and you know our protests in India are a display of how deep that emergency is and then we are in a health emergency but there is the not talked about emergency of uh, economic possibilities yeah you know? people have lost so many livelihoods including in the industrialized world definitely in our part of the world so if you see all these emergencies together I think we need to really develop cradle to cradle models of what maximizes livelihood possibilities, what maximizes production systems that actually regenerate biodiversity on the one hand and reverse climate change on the other. And all of this research has been done. It's just that it, it needs to now move from the research into the economic model. And, you know, my dream is I, I have an earth unit, I built, I didn't choose to, uh, I didn't choose to save seeds. It kind of came to me with the outrage of patenting and GMOs. Um, the Earth University has grown on our biodiversity conservation farm at Navdani, and we offer courses uh, at the Earth University. I'm going to be offering a course on seed from 13th to 15th of February. And, um, we offer many, many, many courses. They used to be physical courses, but they're now on Zoom. But for Indians, they can still come and be with us. I think we need learning centers everywhere. You know, we've got so many learning centers on organic food. I think we need learning centers on rebuilding the broken chain in textiles. Yeah. I think young, I mean, I see lots of young women who are starting to knit now, you know. The other day I wore a knitted cardigan and one of my assistants said, this is what I'm going to do now. I'm going to knit. People are stitching, you know. People are just bursting to do things differently, both because the economic doors have closed on them, but even when the doors didn't close, people are realizing they cannot be part of what I call the 1% economy, my book, Oneness versus the 1%, showing the concentration of economic power with an extraction system where everything lands up on the top. We need to regenerate our living economies and living economies sustain life. 
And that means the life of the earth and the life of those who work. Not only as workers, but as creative agents. I think we've got to bring art back into textiles. When I wear the shawl, the woman who made it didn't do it like manufacture. She did it as an expression of her creativity. We've got to bring care and creativity back in the textile system. And that is where young people, I think young, you know, young people are marching for climate change. They, I think it would be nice to, I tell them, I told Greta, I said, march on Fridays and have a strike. And the rest of the world, we regenerate the earth. And that can be through gardens of hope, but it can also be, you know, one day a week, repair clothes, repair old clothes, don't throw them away. Learn how to stitch. I'm we really, do. Uh, I'm I really happy that- Grandmother's universities where people, one button falls and they throw away clothing. When you can fix a button, I'm really happy that you mentioned actually the, the, the role of art, um, the uh, role of culture, because you uh, said some, some minutes before, um, f we need to take all the learnings from research and they, we need to put them in, in our economic system. Uh, sounds like putting them into practice. Feels like we, we know much, but we need to do something about it. Uh, what role of of our cultural model, of our societal culture of, of art. What is this role and what part probably of our society needs to be transformed that we have enough nutrient soil, so to say, to grow <laughs> these new types of business models, this new type of economy? Well, you know, what comes to my mind, besides what we are doing in our small way in Navdanya, is the fact that in Germany, which is such an industrialized country, come October and October first, look at how everyone dresses up. You know, before the lockdown, I used to transit a lot via Frankfurt and Munich airport. And October first was so beautiful to watch. Everyone came out in their in their clothing as art, not clothing as throwaway. Um, so if you can do it in Oktoberfest, one can do it throughout the year. And it doesn't only have to be a, a, a traditional costume. I think young people will be creative. I think if we get art schools involved, you know, we get architecture schools involved and make them apprentices in this. I think we will have a lot of energy where economy the earth and creativity come together in a new regeneration. What, what is your opinion? Um, I would be really happy if you could share your, uh, your view on this, um, because I see there's such a strong complexity. We are not talking only about the problem of climate, climate crisis, but resource uh, crisis, humanitar humanitarian crisis, so, uh, and COVID now, uh, health crisis. So, um, do you have an idea or an opinion to this? Uh, what could help to probably lower complexity or to bring these topics probably together? Because I feel as an environment, I, environmental activist myself with our work here with Cradle to Cradle NGO, that there are so many topics needed to be discussed, not only climate crisis. We need to tackle resource, cli resource cl uh, crisis at the same time. Do you have any idea, probably telling also our more than 800 volunteers working with us together, how can we help to, to bring all those important topics probably together to, to, to unite uh, uh, behind this as a society, as a global community? So if you look closely, all of these are symptoms of one crisis. You know. The climate disruption is a symptom that is showing up because of the way the planetary boundaries have been broken. But another expression of that same violation is the fact that species are going extinct, that the Amazon is being bulldozed for GMO soya. And because forests are being bulldozed, new pandemics are emerging from forests. 
you know, with Ebola, HIV, all of them have come from the forest, including the corona. Uh, so these are actually different symptoms of a one, one common crisis. And the two things we need to do is make a break with the habit of separation. You know, the Cartesian paradigm, the, the Draconian Newtonian paradigm made us believe that the earth is dead and things are fragmented. We have to recultivate systems thinking. We have to recultivate ecological thinking. And that's where indigenous cultures have never had this rupture in their paradigm of thinking. So we need to bring back systems thinking and we need to realize that separation is an artificial construct. The reality is interrelatedness and interconnectedness, including interconnectedness of different symptoms of the same process. And then we realize that you don't have to keep addressing the symptoms and fighting with each other to say mine is more important and fight over funding and fight over prioritization, but go to the root. And in the root, we find solidarity. Vandana, I think this is a perfect final comment on this. Find solidarity. I'm, uh, I'm very honored that you are here with us. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for all the inspiration as uh, you delivered this final keynote after so many of the panels in depth, in detail. And you, I think you've, from my side, you, you've delivered a wonderful context and just opened uh, our minds and our hearts. Thank you very much, Vandana. And uh, it was our pleasure to have you with us and uh, take care and stay healthy um, to India. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. So, Bye. everyone, this was Vandana, and I'm uh, so happy to uh, finally wrap this conference up. Uh, still, we have uh, high numbers of participants here, and we are very happy that you stayed with us all day long. We've heard discussion panels with experts from all over um, the textile sector and alongside the whole and complex supply chains as we discussed um, not only um, obstacles to the transformation, but I think in the core of our discussions at this 2020, uh, uh, 2021 uh, uh, C2C Summit on Textiles was really to talk about solutions and to talk uh, diverse, uh, not only uh, with companies based uh, uh, in Europe and uh, the Western uh, Hemisphere, but as well as to talk and engage together with uh, the Global South on all those um, very important topics. So finally, uh, it's my pleasure to say thank you again. Thanks to our public sponsorship by means of the Engagement Global Initiative of the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, thank you very much, not only uh, to the address of the Ministry, but also thank you again to Maria Flaxbart for uh, her words as Parliamentary State Secretary of the BMZ. As well as I'd like to thank the State of Berlin, as a lot of foundations helping us uh, in a two years grant with our educational center where we are delivering this conference live from the Cradle to Cradle Lab in Berlin. As well as I'd like to thank, of course, all our speakers who have been connected to us from all over the world, from India to Canada. Thank you very much and a special thank not only to our speakers, but to our co-moderator uh, in the middle of the day, Katja Hansen. Thank you very much. Of course, I'd like to thank you as our participants. Uh, thanks for joining us all day long. Thanks for sending us all those very interesting and important questions. And of course, I'm more than happy to finally uh, thank our team uh, here uh, in our studio at C2C Lab. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank uh, you guys very much, especially to the team around Janine Lehmann and uh, Andreas Jansen, who uh, lead uh, this production together with Ole, Emily, Thomas, Jerome, 
Sophie, as well as our colleagues from the communications team, Birgit, Gesche, Isabel, Lisa. You see there's many people involved to get this big project done because normally we did those conferences in real, in some venue and um, I have the feeling that we somehow uh, made it possible that we can have and continue this discussion uh, in the digital sphere. If you'd like uh, to get more uh, uh, information and get in touch with us, you can follow us on uh, YouTube, on Twitter, on Instagram, um, uh, even on um, uh, what have I missed, Facebook and all the other social networks. Uh, would be really happy to see you there. Upcoming, we have Claudia Kempfert in our next C2C Lab Talk. We will do a lab tour soon and there's going to be the Digital Academy in February. We are all looking very much uh, forward to. So finally, thanks again to you guys, probably at home, I guess. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, stay in touch and stay safe and have a very nice rest of uh, this day here on Thursday, the 28th January. Uh, thank you very much and take care. Bye.